Hello, welcome to Sick Notes. My name's Ed Hope. I'm a junior doctor in the UK. I'm still a junior doctor. I'm still in the UK and I'm still checking out Cells at Work. This is episode 12, Hemorrhagic Shock, part one. So we're off to the liver. Trauma to the liver, such as a laceration, would lead to a lot of bleeding because the liver is a very vascular organ. It's basically just a big bag of blood. Uh, and bleeding, the medical term we use is a hemorrhage. So I wonder if this is going to be the cause of our hemorrhagic shock. We'll see. <laughs> This reminds me a lot of medical school. A lot of the informal teaching happens from people in the year above. So you always think they know way more than you and you'll never kind of get to where they are. But before you know it, it's you. And likewise, you never feel quite fully qualified to teach the people in the years below either. It's a, a strange paradox. <laughs> <laughs> learning the six functions of the blood it may seem trivial to learn these kind of lists of functions of organs and systems but actually these are super important for example in this episode we know there's going to be a circulatory collapse so it's going to start failing in the form of a hemorrhagic shock so knowing these functions will help us understand the signs and symptoms that the patient is going to experience and also guide our management. So the patient in this episode is going to struggle to retain moisture. So we won't have enough blood to perfuse their brain and other organs. They'll have trouble with gas exchange. So they'll be breathing faster to try and compensate. They'll have difficulty transporting nutrients, so they'll be very fatigued and they'll struggle regulating their temperature, so they'll become very cold. Protecting the body is less relevant and that would be referring to the immune system, which is less of a problem in an acute bleed. But repairing wounds, absolutely. When we have a bleed, it would use up our platelets and clotting factors and they are need to be regulated in the blood or otherwise we can have problems. So as always with cells at work, it's an important bit of learning here that they've picked out. <laughs> Sorry to shock you like that. I like the fact they've put that in because that is kind of the term that most of the people understand by the term shock. We'll no doubt talk about the medical definition of shock a few times in this video because what you think of a shock is not what doctors think of. You know, the layman's term is very much this where we have like an emotional reaction to something extreme. In medicine, shock is a life-threatening emergency when our circulation system fails and it can happen for a number of reasons, one of them being hemorrhage where we don't have enough blood pumped around our body um, to meet the demands of our tissues. It's not our job to get screamed at by that person, is it now? I don't know if this is purposeful. I think it is because I know cells at work do a great job of talking about the physiology, the anatomy and the pathology, but they also seem to mimic kind of what it's like to be a doctor and what it's like to work in medicine because we do get the instance and it shouldn't happen but we do have it where people do get screamed at and shouted at um, and that's because of the nature of the work we do so you know the strains of the system that we work in but also the nature of the work it's very emotive um, and so this is a nice reflection on that you'll never get through your career without someone being harsh to you <laughs> They have a good point here. The white blood cells are the kind of violent, aggressive types, but hey, they're on your team. I like to try and work out what bacteria this could be too. Uh, I have no idea who this guy is. He looks like a kind of evil version of SpongeBob SquarePants' mate with a bone helmet on. Any ideas who this is? Let me know. 
Oh, so we know it's coming to the end of the season because here we see this nice lap of honour where the new red blood cell is introduced to all the characters we've seen in the series. So the eosinophil from episode four, the platelets, the dendritic cell, the macrophage here, and the B cell and Mars cell are still arguing <laughs> about who's right or wrong from episode five, the one about the allergies. <laughs> What? Are they actually supposed to be in love? I know it's kind of been hinted that, you know, they like each other, but the romantic thing I always thought was just the internet doing it. I wouldn't recommend love between a red and white blood cell. I mean, the neutrophils are designed to kill. <laughs> Anything that activates them is asking for trouble. <laughs> Just like any other day was unfolding. Right, now they've done it. <laughs> now they're asking for trouble. It's, it's like saying the quiet word in A&E. This is, this is the most worrying thing that I've heard so far. We should just end the season there before, <laughs> before anything happens. What? Of course, an ad break. I'm guessing this is the trauma that's caused our hemorrhage then. Let's see what happens next. Okay, the, I like this. So the order is for all blood cells to gather in the center of the body. That may seem like a throwaway line, but this is medically accurate because whenever we have circulation issues, our bodies prioritize the key organs. So they'll reduce the blood flow to our limbs. We call this peripherally shutting down. Although it's super important for your body to keep you alive, it actually makes it much harder for the medical team for us to try and get access, to try and get lines into the bloodstream for life-saving treatments. <laughs> An overpowering blood pressure. I'm not quite sure why they'd say it's overpowering because in a bleed would expect the blood pressure to actually reduce. Maybe it's the initial adrenaline rush, so that kind of fight or flight response we get after injury. And there are a few hormones that modulate your body's response to injury. So adrenaline or epinephrine is one of them. We've all had that feeling in our body of the raised heart rate, which would also increase our blood pressure and divert blood flow to the heart and muscles ready for action. But as we mentioned before, we don't want blood wasted to our limbs when we're bleeding. So how does adrenaline manage to do both things? Well, without going too deep into the physiology, at low concentrations, adrenaline would dilate the blood vessels to the muscles to you know, get them ready for that fight or flight response. But when things get really critical, we get high concentrations of adrenaline, which actually constricts the blood flow to the muscles. So that's when we start getting peripherally shut down and conserving the blood for our vital organs. So that's how one kind of chemical, one hormone can do both things. <laughs> What's causing this spike in blood pressure? I just told you. <laughs> well, what might be causing it? When are you guys listening? <laughs> I'm not sure why they'd be concerned with getting invaded by antigens. So antigens, I guess in this context, they'd be referring to things on a virus or bacteria that they can recognize. So they're really talking about getting invaded by a bacteria or virus. Yes, any trauma that breaks the skin would compromise our barrier and could introduce things like bacteria and the potential for infection, but it's not a huge issue initially. I mean, blood loss can kill you in seconds to minutes, whereas infection is going to take hours, really. Don't get me wrong, infection is a major complication in trauma. It's just blood loss is the priority first. Okay, so we have a life-threatening injury. 
um, tissue and blood vessels damage near the head area. This is not what I expected actually. I thought for some reason we'd be heading for an abdominal injury, um, but this kind of injury is really a double whammy. Firstly, the kind of acute trauma itself can cause bruising on the brain, what we call a contusion. Your brain is basically like this jelly inside a hard skull that if it gets slammed against anything, the brain can get slammed against the skull on the inside and cause injury, what we call a traumatic brain injury. Secondly, trauma may damage a blood vessel inside the skull, what we call an intracranial bleed. Now the big problem with that is that the blood will end up occupying space within the skull, which is obviously a fixed object, and therefore as the bleed increases in size, it will actually squash the brain and cause damage that way. <laughs> I love this kind of battle cry that's going on. You know, this is representing, I guess, the uh, the hormones being released by the body, but also the kind of nerves, the sympathetic nervous system would be activated too. Um, although <laughs> they kind of focus on the immune cells here, the white blood cells, where it's, you know, as we said before, infection is less of an issue in an acute bleed. At this point in time, although they are very cute, this bleeding problem is a job for the platelets and the clotting factors. And they need to get to work sorting out the bleed as we saw in episode two when they managed that scrape wound. Yay! So there you go. They have eventually give a rallying call <laughs> to the platelets too. Oh. This, I like this little arc here. So we saw earlier that we had the kind of book wise student that could list, you know, all the kind of functions of what the blood does. But when under pressure, this is where experience kicks in. She knows that her job is more important than ever to deliver that oxygen. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So this is weird. The blood flows faster than usual. So this is the body compensating for, you know, the blood loss. An increased heart rate due to blood loss means we have therefore lost at least 15% of our circulating volume at this point. Uh, back in med school, I was taught about the kind of four stages of blood loss. And an easy way to remember it is that it's kind of quantified in the same way as tennis is scored. So stage one, losing up to around about 15% of your blood loss, probably not a lot happens. Uh, we kind of have that amount in reserve sitting in our veins ready for action. And that is why that we can, you know, give blood, donate blood um, and not really feel any worse after it. If we're losing between 15 and 30% of our blood, then we call that stage two. And how does the body respond? Well, we see the heart rate increase to try and compensate. So that's why I said here we've lost at least 15% of our blood loss because the heart rate's increased. And that maintains the blood pressure adequately. Between 30 and 40% of our blood loss, you're looking at stage three, and that is when a heart rate is still raised, but it's no longer able to compensate, so our blood pressure then begins to fall. Yeah, man, first set. Stage four, well, we're talking about over 40% blood loss, and we know from our tennis where that's heading. Game, set, and match. <laughs> it's this guy again. It wouldn't be cells at work <laughs> without a pathogen popping its head up. Uh, we see Pseudomonas here. He seems to be the bug of choice for this person, like, cropping up in, like, four or five episodes. And you know, there's some realism to this. People tend to get infections from the same bug um, as different people have different bacteria that naturally inhabit their bodies. And we kind of use this to our advantage. For example, if someone has a chest infection or a urinary tract infection, we tend to use previous cultures to help guide which antibiotic to treat with. Yeah, so it's quiet here. So that's probably talking about how the area's been peripherally shut down. So the blood flow is being prioritized to the main organs. So wherever the white blood cell here 
isn't getting blood flow. This would certainly be happening at the later stages of blood loss, so this is not looking good. No! It's a classic cliffhanger. We're in a bad way and they've left us with quite a brutal cliffhanger. So we'll have to check out the next episode. So thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you have enjoyed my thoughts on this episode. Not as much physiology and pathology that we've seen in previous episodes, but I mean, they're lining it up, I'm sure, for the next one. Just leaves me to say thank you so, so much for all your continued support on the channel. I know this particular review of this series is super popular and, you know, it just blows me away all the support you guys give me. So thank you so much. And so until next time, I'll see you soon.